Hey, me and Joe are up here uh, with Marijuana Resolve. We're going to talk to two of uh, the senators that have sponsored some uh, decrim le legislation, see how it's going. We're going to talk to Senator Baruth and Senator Benning. So uh, hope you enjoy uh, this show. Test that mic, I might have to give it uh, okay. We'll test the mic. All right, hello everybody. This is Daryl Pillsbury from Marijuana Resolve, and uh, we are up here at the Vermont State House with two, which I just found out, two freshman senators. We have Senator Baruth and Senator Benning. Um, Senator Benning, you're Caledonia County, is that correct. correct? And you are Chittenden County, correct? Exactly. Uh, Senator Benning, just start with you real quick. Um, since you guys are both freshmen, what decided? To, how come you decided to put your hat in the ring and and here you are? I've always been interested in politics. I've had a, uh, a long-standing history with a guy named Graham Newell, who was actually the state senator from Caledonia County. Uh, was in this building for 26 years, and as a result of my uh, being friends with him, I became interested in the position that he was in and decided to take a stab at it. When the opportunity came about, I had my kids finally through college and was able to actually leave the day job for a while and have something else to do, and this seemed like a real fun thing to look into. So now you're on your second year, because you got it, yeah, so you're, what'd you think of it so far? I love it. Yeah, is Walking awesome? into this building every day, it, it's priceless. When you walk up the steps and you look, you think, how am I so lucky to be able to work in this building? Um, the people who are here are great. It's a collegial atmosphere in the Senate, and the ability to come in here and actually make an impact on people's lives in a good way, um, I think is one of the most cherished things I'll ever remember. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Senator Bruce, same question to you. Yeah, uh, two things for me. One was single-payer health care, and the other oh. was Vermont Yankee. Um, yeah. Both seem to be coming to a head in the Senate. So when I started running, the Senate had yet to vote on whether or not to shut the plant down. Um, but it seemed as though that vote probably wasn't going to be the final word, and the Senate would be the place where all the action was on that issue. So uh, I began to run at that point in 2009 as someone who wanted to shut Yankee down, someone who was uh, opposed to nuclear power in general. And uh, you know, it was a year and a half long campaign, and I was amazed at how much support I got, not only in Chittenden County, but down in the southern end of the state. Too. Oh, you were a hero down there. Well, I, I would say that those people are heroes to me because I would not be sitting here uh, for all sorts of reasons if it weren't for people like Steve West mm -hmm. at WKVT and Gordy Baldwin and, uh, and Lee and, and Frederick and all of those people that, uh, that I've worked with down through WKVT. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And uh, now that you're in the building, you get that same feeling because I saw you smiling and isn't it something yeah. it's a Vermont citizens legislature yeah. I mean you know we all when you leave here you do go back home to your job and you are I mean you're back home with your neighbors on right. the weekends you know right. I mean, it's, a, it's a different spot here and and people actually do corner you when you're going and doing the groceries and shopping and it's I, I, yeah, I loved it I could do a whole show right down that you guys <laughs> but since we're here for a specific reason and one of the things that really caught my eye um, Senator Benning, especially, you have an R next to your name, and you are from the Northeast Kingdom, um, which is a little more conservative than my neck of the woods, um, and you are a co-sponsor of a decrim bill. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of why you are on with Senator Baruth and maybe a few others? Actually, if I could just step in, I, I would say Joe is the lead sponsor, and he brought me along on his 
bill. So I think really? that's even. Oh, more that is more. I didn't realize he was, and I should have, should have his name. Well, I didn't. I don't have the bill in front of me actually. So your name would have came first. So okay then. Why? Um, for me, the genesis of this started in 1975 when I was a senior in high school, and I was a guitar player in a rock and roll band. Um, most of the band members freely partook. I made a conscious decision not to. And I mean, all through high school and college, I just decided it wasn't for me, and it was my thing to stand out from the crowd by saying, I wasn't going to partake. If you wanted to, I could tolerate that. That's fine. That's your life. And you had no impact on me. I had no impact on you. Um, as luck would have it, however, my band was in a uh, house where we were having practice. And it happened to be a place that the police had been looking at for some time and decided to raid it while we were there. And in an upstairs bedroom, they found two empty hashish pipes. And I will never forget this experience because having been arrested, brought down to the police station, given a citation to appear in court, and then getting to arraignment day, um, it was horrific for me and for my families because I, literally I was being charged with something I had never done. And you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, 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 sure, but uh, I'm not talking like Bill Clinton, I'm very serious, I had never done it. <laughs> and the bottom line is I get to arraignment day and the prosecutor comes out and he says, if the owner of the house takes the rap, we'll dismiss the charges against everybody else. Well, of course, everybody else was in favor of that, and the owner of the house sort of said, all right, I'll do that, and that's what happened. We went downstairs from the courtroom into the police station. Now, the police chief was a friend of my family for three generations, and when we got to the police station, he took us aside, and he literally, in front of me and my parents, tore up the file that they had on me. My fingerprints and my mug shots were in that file, and they said, as far as we're concerned, this never happened. All right, fast forward from 1975 to 1982, and I'm sitting down to fill out the application to take the bar exam, having gone through law school. And I run into this question that says, have you ever been arrested? Well, my brain is telling me, the cops said, as far as we're concerned, this never happened. But if they answer that question, or if I answer that question and I say no, and they go back and actually find a record, I'll be forever barred from entering the bar. So I went back before I finished the application and I, sure enough, found the file was still there. What they had torn up in front of me was just a copy. I had to go through an expungement process in the state of New Jersey to have that all taken care of and I still had to answer the question on the bar exam. I told them the exact same story I've just told you that I did in fact get arrested, it's all been expunged you can do the record check and you're not gonna find my name, but I want you to know that that potential has been out there. Um, so at that moment in time, I knew that this whole thing was a dumb way to approach what they have always classified as the war on drugs. The fundamental principle is that if you decide to partake, you're not having an impact on me. And that is not a crime to me. So anybody who wants to partake, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're not having an impact on my ability to do what I do in my daily life, the law has no business being in the middle of this discussion. So that's what started it for me. Um, when I got to this building, I realized I could actually have an impact there. Um, so we got together. I got cool, to isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's a powerful and <laughs> heavy is, thing to deal with. Um, but I knew Philip from being introduced to him here when we were first um, given our training. And um, I said, you know, the way that you want to approach this is you take somebody who is from the conservative neck of the woods, you join them with somebody who is from the more liberal neck of the woods, and you do it together. Because if a liberal comes in and tries to do it, most people are gonna say, ah, oh, there's another liberal trying to get a marijuana thing in. Okay. If a conservative does it alone, they're gonna be looked like a lunatic. Um, but if two people do it together, it has a much better chance of gaining some traction. And sure enough, it got traction. So that's what got me into this discussion. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. That's, matter of fact, now that you've been in the building, you'll see a lot of people do try and do that. They make sure they, what was the big thing in the House side, if you could get four of us on, you know, you had everybody, you had the progressives, the Democrats. Right. So, <coughs> Philip, uh, and, and I, you know, I know your background a little bit better than Senator Bennings, um, but uh, while, you know, you saw him do that, said, hey, sounds like a good idea, let's try and do this together. 
Well, actually, Joe, Joe suggested to me that we work together on it with the idea of making it bipartisan. But, but I think the other thing that um, is important about having a Republican on board with it is that it turns the discussion much more easily to the fiscal side. Um, so the Republican Party has, you know, they've gambled everything in terms of their brand on lower taxes, lower government spending, et cetera. Um, you can make the argument, and I, and I do often, that the state spends about $800,000 a year uh, prosecuting and incarcerating people for marijuana. If you didn't have to spend that, you could save it or you could plow it into other government programs, the point being that you'd be reducing an unnecessary government footprint and then you could have the discussion about do you want to do something that is necessary, do you want to um, return that money to the taxpayer. So, you know, I think Joe and I come at it from different perspectives. He has a more libertarian, Republican approach. Uh, he, he will, if you give him a chance, he'll talk about motorcycle helmets and how he doesn't like them. And I think there's an element of that in this discussion too, that if you plant a seed in your backyard and it grows up into a mature plant and you dry it and you smoke it, uh, what's the government's role there in terms of preventing that in the same way that if you ride your motorcycle for Joe? I see a difference there. I, I think in terms of, uh, of helmets, there's an argument maybe to be made on the, on the, the healthcare side. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could go. You guys have already yeah. hit on so many points. I, 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 I tell you what, I wish I could sit you guys in here for like an hour and a half and just keep talking because um, the helmet law, you got, there was a rep up there, uh, he's no longer there, John Rogers, who was big with you on that one, whereas I was more on, on your side yeah. and I had him and I loved, I lived in New Hampshire, you know, but everything, and you know what, there's no reason, that's the good part about this. You do come out at different sides, so other people right. get to see different sides. Right. You know, because um, I come at it at your side, and as a person who actually has partaken, uh, and um, well, has a conflict with that when I was serving as a state representative, mm -hmm. it was a major conflict for me personally, you know. Uh, and that, and I didn't want to feel like a criminal because for me it wasn't going to the thrush tab. Well, you don't have that anymore. But for me it wasn't. I don't drink and stuff. You know, my thing was at the end of the day. I really, but I didn't want to feel like a damn criminal. And I, right. and, 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 I, and I am. I'm serving the, the people of Vermont. You gotta, you gotta, you're at a different right. standard, whether you like it or not. So that was one of the great things about leaving this building, was I no longer felt guilty and I could smoke again. To be honest with you, it just made me feel whoo hoo because when you're in here doing what we do, mm -hmm. or what you do now, there's some pressure and there is some stress. And I thought I was handling it pretty good, but it builds up. Two quick so. things just to tell you, though, Daryl. Uh, first, I feel the same way about the government telling me I have to wear a hat on my head when I get on a motorcycle. I'm not going to run into you if I don't have my helmet on my head. And the second thing is the Thrush Tavern is actually back open. So you know, oh, all right. <laughs> we should have done everything there, Joe. I didn't realize it was open anymore. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah. It's and and I'm a person that because you know that my thing to that is when you're going to stop. Uh, are we going to have a bath mat police coming in to make sure you put slip pads on your bathroom to make sure you don't slip? Because that's where so many people slip in a elderly, break their right. hips. I mean, the statistics, if you play around like I did with those, it's unbelievable how many people slip in a bathtub that are over the age of 70, break their hips, and then will die from that because they broke their hip. Well, anyway, we got to get back onto the marijuana issues. So you have a bill now in the Senate. How many other sponsors do you have on that bill? Do you know approximately? Well, the, there's an underlying bill that has to do with sentencing, which is 138. That's the bill that yep, has been introduced by the committee itself. Our amendment was attached to that. Dick Sears, the committee chair, came Very along nice. and put in uh, his own amendment, which was designed as a substitute amendment. So the way this process works is if the body votes on the substitute amendment and passes it, it knocks out our amendment. All of that discussion was happening on Friday afternoon. Uh, tempers were getting kind of short. People were hungry. Everybody wanted to leave for the weekend. Senator Ash got up and asked to have the whole thing lie. That's what ended up happening, although it was a 13 to 13 vote, I believe, and then the uh, President Pro Tem, who was up at the podium, cast a vote to 
have it go okay. live. Um, that is where it got left Friday. Now, between Friday and today, I've had a lot of conversation with several people trying to keep this thing moving forward. And I came back in this morning and I had a conversation with Senator Sears. We figured out a way to keep the ball rolling in a given direction, but have us all come together and do it as one. So what is literally now on the table, we've asked to have the bill brought back from the table. It is now on for the action calendar. Um, there is going to be an amendment attached to it that will have Philip, myself, Dick Sears, and Tim Ash, all the four players who were actually named out there, um, on this bill. And what's going to happen is both the marijuana question and an alcohol question, which had been raised by Senator Sears, and this is a legitimate question, he gave this example. If I am a kid under 21 years old, and I'm in my car, and I've got my beer here, and I've got my ounce of marijuana here. What would happen is, if the Benning Baruth Amendment goes through, the ounce is going to go into civil court, but the beer is going to go into criminal court. He didn't want to see that happen. And that makes perfect sense to me. So we take both of those issues, alcohol and marijuana. There's a summer study committee called the Misdemeanor Sentencing Review Committee that is going to be charged with examining both issues and reporting back to the legislature with the intent of developing a bill to take care of both of those problems. I also spoke with House Speaker Shaft Smith, and he was okay with having that happen. Um, Shaft Smith, as you may know, has been very opposed to anything happening with marijuana, but he's okay with this committee coming back to, to make recommendations. Now, I don't necessarily know that he'd be in favor of what those recommendations may be, but at least the ball is rolling in the right direction. We have a time frame that's imposed by the committee having charged with making an annual report. And it gives us the, uh, the ability to reform at a time when we have the ball rolling in that same direction and hopefully come up with legislation that's going to make a lot of sense. But it sounds like that won't happen until the next session then. That, because you've you got to do your summer study. And so so nothing's going to happen this session with, it, with it, any of those bills. You're just going to try and, when you come back the next round, have it right in order and then maybe start right from the beginning? And Tech, well, I, I don't want to say it's starting right from the beginning because that, that's well, kind I of don't minimizing <laughs> what, we, what we have accomplished. You know, this discussion would have run into a brick wall at the House. And that's so right. whatever happened in the Senate, even if we managed to pass something, it would have died right then and there. The issue is not going to die. It is actually set in motion in such a way that the, the forward momentum of the discussion with the people combined together to talk about it is going to advance that issue, I think, much better next session than we could have done this session. And I would, I would point out we had much the same result for migrant workers. Uh, the Agriculture Committee came out with a bill to allow migrant workers from Mexico and Guatemala to get driver's licenses within the state of Vermont. Um, ran into a brick wall in the Committee of Jurisdiction and we wound up with a study that's gonna go forward over the summer. So in both cases, you could say, if you, if you took the most pessimistic view, that we wound up with a glass half empty and it's gonna be a glass that's dry come next session. I don't tend to see it that way because farm to plate, for instance, which many, many people statewide worked on to develop as a concept and to turn into an action plan, that action plan occurred in a study committee and they came forward with uh, you know, action points that could be very easily dropped into legislation. And so my first year, last year on the Agriculture Committee, that was what we spent our time doing was converting into legislation the things that the committee had made usable for us. So I'm hoping that on migrant workers' licenses and on decriminalization, we come uh, back next January and the committees of jurisdiction get not just um, we studied this issue and it's interesting, but we studied this issue, we've worked out these approaches, here are some points that could be, with a little futzing, dropped right into legislation. Yeah, and actually I serve on that committee, so I'm gonna make sure that there's a bill before we get back here in January. Yeah, that's good then. Uh, you'll, yeah, and you can, do, you can craft it with what you get anyway, from uh, that trade. Right. Um, what two communities do you sit on, by the way? Institutions and Natural Resources and Energy. Excellent. And your ag and? Education. Good, good. Um, 
Yeah, because on this on the center side, you actually get your two committees yeah. on the outside. We just do one because what we always said was, you know, we did all the heavy lifting. I know how that goes too, right? Yeah, you exactly. propose it and we clean it up. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Actually, you know, my first year here, that's what a lot of people said. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, you know, we like you said with the money part, one of the things that I think is going gonna, is gonna to change it over is the fact that Vermont, you know, we're very limited in how we can get revenues here with the population we have. And I just believe, I want to go further, of course, than what mm -hmm. you guys are seeing. I would like to see it totally legalized anyway um, and and taxed and then that money go into maybe helping the single payer model uh, or whatever because I believe that would be such a boom. Not only the money we would be saving, the 800000 that you think we would save, which I think is higher, uh, the money we would save by not putting people in prison. I mean, it, it, the money, to me, the dollars are astronomical for yeah. the state of Vermont. And I think that is going to be the hurdle that once we get over that. So all these steps that we get there, the more we can get people, just the medical marijuana when we pass that, we found out that that wasn't you know, gonna change the whole state of Vermont, although you still had to go get it illegally because we still haven't got the spend, although that's ready to roll now, the dispensary bill, yes. we just gotta figure out how to Four set of those it up. are coming online pretty soon. Yeah. Let's not sell your viewers short though because you made the statement you wanted to go farther than we were willing to go. I think if you get more into the conversation, you're going to find that we want to go there too. But as you well know, in this building, getting to where you want to be yeah. takes a series of baby steps, and it takes a lot of coalition work to try to make that happen. We see this, I believe, as a first step on the road to getting to where you want to be. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a first good step. I mean, I'm, I was glad to see at least the Senate side doing something, because we do have a problem with the Speaker of the House on, on that side. She right. just isn't, it's not going to happen. Um, unless a lot of people do put a little more pressure on them, which I hope does happen. One of the things that um, people will say, uh, we study a lot of things, especially in this house. That seems to be like the, you know, the you didn't win, you didn't lose, we're going to study it type of thing. And I can't tell you how many studies we had in the eight years I was there on, well, you probably have had one this year, another one, mm -hmm. on institutions sure. uh, with our prison system. We move the women three times. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, ah. Um, so I could go on and that one at my own. But I wanted to follow that up by saying we are a citizen's legislature. That's why the studies, you know, mm -hmm. are important to right. us. Exactly. Um, and I don't want to get off the subject too much, but you brought up the VY thing. And what always killed me with the judge's decision on the VY thing was how safety wasn't an issue with VY. And when, since you guys have been up here, I mean, safety's almost brought up with every issue you discuss, isn't it? I mean, I was amazed at how many times we bring up safety. safety. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the judge said safety wasn't an issue, but Mirtha was um, making the point that federal law reserves the safety regulation piece for the federal government. And as a part of that, legislators had been told for years that they needed to avoid discussing safety uh, to the point where when I ran as an anti-nuclear candidate in 2009, I'd go to a forum and all the incumbents would refuse to talk about the safety of the plant. And that's one of the things that I was talking a lot about. And you know, it just strikes me as a crazy up is down kind of world where the federal government over the decades has gentled the states to the idea that when it comes to nuclear safety and radiation threat, you cannot speak. And, and I just, my, speaking only for myself, I think it's long past time that the states push back hard on that and say, if a chemical plant comes and puts PCBs in our river, we will stop it in any way we can. And if a nuclear plant comes and puts tritium in our river and, and tritium in our fish, we will stop it. And, and that's where I am on that. Point. Interestingly, that, that sort of brings us back to the marijuana question because the federal government has been for years dangling this fruit out with federal money that we have been enticed by and as a result, it has driven our policy with our own citizens on what we do in the war on drugs. Um, unfortunately, we have succumbed to those federal dollars so much and so often, it literally has now become what we just automatically react to. If there's federal money out there, we want it, we yes, get sir. it, and the restrictions that come along with that are actually impinging on our own rights, which brings me back to the helmet question. 
<laughs> exactly, I told you we were going. That's exactly <laughs> what happened with the. Has he got? A, do you have that in? Do you have that bill in? No, no, no. You so we have this discussion pretty much every day. Yeah. <laughs> As you well know, baby the police have already got to him. The state police already got to the senator. Well, Please don't do that. No, actually, um, Keith Flynn and I are, are doing quite a bit of talk. Keith Flynn is the Department of Public Safety Commissioner, yeah. and he is in favor of getting rid of the helmet. Is he really? And so the two of us have been sitting down trying to plan the exact same strategy that he and I were planning for this marijuana amendment. Keith Flynn was directly involved in the amendment because he was looking for a way to have the state police not have to continue to analyze samples at the state police laboratory. He also wanted to move police officers out of the courtroom and let them deal with it in the traffic bureau just like the traffic ticket would be done. Right. Those two steps would save him a considerable amount of money. So there's language in our amendment that actually calls for that to happen. And that comes directly from Keith Flynn. Good. But as you know, baby steps. Baby it, steps it is. Baby it is. Steps. And, and you know, part of the reason law enforcement isn't on board, in my opinion, is they get so much money right. that supports them. You know, it's hard to say, ah, uh, no, we're for, you know, decriminalization of marijuana, but then you lose all the federal, you know, it's just hard to say. Well, you got these towns, I think there was a town in New Hampshire where, very tiny town, and they're, they're getting a tank, basically. Keene, Keen, New Hampshire, yeah. you should see that thing. It's unbelievable. It is, they got it, there's now an uproar. They, uh, the, 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 the councilman accepted it, but now this, they might have to give it back. But the it, people are like, what are we really yeah. doing? Just because we could accept this and take it, what are we doing with a $230,000 truck? And, and uh, basically what the War on Drugs has done is it's, it's empowered people who are of, a, of an enforcement military mindset. Here's the tools. Here's the, the toys. Um, yeah. Take this money and beef up your local law enforcement. And once you've got it beefed up, whether it's pepper spray or tasers or tanks, you need to use them, right? Because otherwise they're, they're not self-justifying and people begin to ask, why are you spending $60,000 a year to maintain the tank? I so, think the 1% getting scared of the 99% and they're starting yeah. to arm there. You're sounding more like a Republican. I guess. <laughs> Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can do that. Uh, how much time do we have, Joe? Are we, are we toward the end of our 30 minutes? Well, listen, gentlemen, first off, I thank you so much for taking time and seeing yeah, sure. us. I also thank you so much for an awful lot of people that feel the same way about me on this issue for at least taking that baby step and getting us headed in the right direction, hopefully. We do have a governor. I think that will sign a bill should it happen. Mm -hmm. um, any last words, uh, that, or not last words, <laughs> but any last statements you'd like to make before we uh, go? Two years from now, signing party, Thrush Tavern, be there. Oh, I will, if you guys have a signing. Stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, gentlemen, I thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. And uh, good luck to you next. To I imagine you. both are running for re-election, the way you were talking. Oh, yeah. That's the other oh, one. So, we should have said, we so, should have said, make sure we get re-elected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, if you are a supporter, check out, if you're in their area and you happen to see the show, you know, there's another reason you can support each of these guys. Uh, I'd like to see them both come back, to be honest with you. So uh, anyway, thank you for serving the state of Vermont Thanks, also, guys. guys. Appreciate it. Okay, we are with Senator Ash from, where are you from, Senator? Shinta County. Oh yeah, you're a Democrat progressive. Very close to Vermont. Yeah. Shinta County. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Chittenden County. What town? Vermont, I kind of. So listen, we've, uh, we've been interviewing a few senators today about different issues. The, one of them uh, was Marijuana uh, Resolve, which is a group I'm with. Uh, and we brought up, um, we came up to talk to Senator Bennings and Baruch. Yeah. We both have the... Uh, S138 uh, amendments. Uh, yeah. yeah, amendments and stuff. Now, you, and it kind of struck me when I'm reading it on the paper. Yes. Because uh, I'm just, I don't know what's going on up here. I, I know when you're up here, it's uh, different than what you're reading. Different time zones. Yeah. And uh, so I read it in the paper, and it says this yeah, Senator Tim Ash, uh, Democrat progressive, killed the bill. I was like, wow. Well, killed the bill. But then I found out he tabled it. That's not killing it. Right. Big difference. Um, so explain to me why you did that. Well, I'm glad you clarified that. Yep. You should know better. The, um, first, I should say, when I was on the Burlington City Council, I actually proposed decriminalizing marijuana within city limits. And at the time, I believe there were three out of 14 city councilors who were willing to do that. The state's attorney at the time, the police chief all came out against it, and we got crushed. Uh, but we did our best. Um, and so my position on this is, frankly, that we should legalize marijuana. Um, and in that regard, the two amendments which were being considered last week, in my opinion, don't go far enough. 
And that gets to the heart of my concern on Friday afternoon. I get onto the Senate floor, we're taking up a bill on search warrants, and all of a sudden an amendment is being passed out to decriminalize marijuana and go through a certain you know, fine, tiered fine system. And I said, well, that's very interesting that not a single one of us got a heads up. And it seemed there were three or four people in the whole Senate who had been in on this little surprise yeah. attack. Uh, right after uh, Senators Benning and Baruth presented their amendment, immediately Senator Sears presented oh, a substitute I amendment. Probably on board. He might have already known ahead of time this yeah. was going to happen. And I'm looking at it, and let's just let's start with the Benning and Baruth amendment. The Benning and Baruth amendment had, perhaps for the first time that I've ever seen in, in law, uh, the burden of proving the state's case against you be borne by the accused person. So it said if you believe you've been wrongly accused of possessing marijuana, you don't want to pay the civil fine, you have to go and pay for a lab to test what's actually in your yes. possession. So I thought that struck me as a little weird. That was an accommodation of the Commissioner of Public Safety, which I wouldn't want to accommodate. The Substitute amendment, which was the one that I believe had been voted on five years ago by the Senate um, prior to my being here. Yeah, that was when I was uh, here. Had, had a more coherent uh, structure to it, but I think the fines were actually too high. I mean, I actually believe that they're, they're grossly unfair, grossly too high, and I wanted an opportunity to actually find some you know, middle point, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, to make the uh, civil fine perhaps more commensurate with what I don't even believe is an offense, but at least under law it is. And so I got up on the floor, and this is the part that doesn't get you know, captured in the little paragraph about me ordering the bill to lie temporarily, was I said, I found myself in an unusual position because I probably want to be more expansive in the liberalizing of these laws than anyone in the Senate. But I have had but five minutes to actually look at either of the two proposals which are on the table, which were, are inadequate for me to, to improve yeah. these bills. And uh, so I said, uh, you know, I said, I don't need to talk to you about generational issues. I don't think I know a single person in my orbit who thinks our current laws make sense. But I want to know how we can make them as uh, appropriate to the offense as possible. And so I suggested we take a little more time. Then it was clear that the proponents were, of the, I should say, the, the, the authors of the amendments wanted to take immediate action anyways, despite a number of people saying, I would vote yes, but I don't like the way this is going down, and I want a couple days, maybe an opportunity to think this through a little bit, think about whether we have the right uh, response to this issue. Uh, but since the voices weren't being heard, that's when I said I, I moved to order it to lie. Not to kill the bill, but to buy a little time. As you know, ordering something to lie means it yeah. stays on the calendar sort of in inactive state. Right. Then you pull it back. And people are sometimes doing stuff behind the scenes to try and... Exactly. Know. And to make a long story short, which I hope proves my point, is... Today, we took the bill, we put the bill back on the action calendar right. so we could take it up tomorrow. tomorrow. Now that people have had the weekend at least to think about it and, and, and come up with a more appropriate response. The other issue is that the Speaker of the House is saying he's not moving yeah. the bill. So the Senate can come up with its you know, symbolic action, but if it's going to die when it gets to the House, all it has done has been a fairly uh, deliberate uh, attempt to make an interest group happy. But I don't want to just make the interest group happy, I want to actually pass right. legislation. And so what we're proposing now is having the, what's called the Misdemeanor Sen Sentencing Commission um, actually take a look at this and come back with recommendations about what an appropriate tiered fine structure would look like so we have time to pass a bill next year. And it appears, at least uh, at this point, that the Speaker is okay be, with that process. That's if he gets elected, if he's the Speaker again, which is probably going to happen. Understood. Uh, and that's where we got to really, I was kind of surprised at how opposed he really is, too. I mean, well, I, 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 I don't understand I, it. I, I don't either. I was shocked. I, yeah. I served with the guy, and we'd go out and, you know, uh, well, I don't drink, but you have a cup of coffee. And, uh, you know, and I was just kind of uh, amazed that he was that strong. Um, and I think something has to do a little bit from what I've heard is his spouse, though, as she's a doctor, I believe, yeah. so yeah. has a little bit to do with that, too. So anyway, but in my, I'm no doctor, but I work in a hospital, and from what I've seen, alcohol and prescribed drugs are really causing much more of a havoc on our citizenry than marijuana. I think I agree with you completely. So this Just keep going. I'll hold the door since I got it. Still, you are still hanging out up here. I was. I was just oh, kind of visiting. Good. Good. Uh, for Daryl Pillsbury, 
along with Vita Crochetta, who couldn't be with us today, and my cameraman Joe, who is with me today. Um, we want to thank you for watching this special edition brought to you right from the State House, right here in Montpelier, Vermont. And uh, again, we got to thank the Senators uh, Benning and Baruth for uh, co sponsoring the uh, marijuana bill, uh, S138. And we'll see what happens. As you know, there's not going to be probably a lot happening this session, so we better be ready for the next round. Uh, I imagine both of them senators will be back. The bill will probably be back in play, and we're going to have to start working on it, folks. If you are a person who believes in decriminalization of marijuana or even legalization of marijuana, start paying attention. We now have the groundwork to make something happen in Vermont, especially in the 2012 session, okay? So let's pay attention to what's going on and let's start making sure we get a hold of uh, our local senators and state representatives because the problem actually relies on the House side with House Speaker Shaft Smith. We're going to have to work on that. So again, we'll see you next time right here on Marijuana Resolve. Thank you.